Well, thank you very much to everyone who's been sharing their memories of plays and musicals on the Town Hall, the Arts Centre and the Parochial Hall stages. Great to hear them, keep sharing, and at times it felt like friends reunited. My guest today has probably spent more time behind the scenes than actually on stage. At one four-year period, they designed 16 sets for plays and four pantomimes. They were involved in 17 school shows and as administrator of Newry Musical Fish, oversees 14,000 performances in a single year. This year it's been very different and I suppose very challenging for the fish. Um, but as chair of Northern Ireland's Festival Forum, Mary Goss has oversight of how other festivals are preparing and what challenges they face. But how did she get involved in the Newry Fish? I had come into the Fesh uh, committee in 1983. Um, Alma Brown had, had brought me there, telling me I had all sorts of good reasons to join, one of them being flower arranging and the second one being in case they ever needed a new certificate I could design. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> or possibly even a programme cover if they were break, you know, breaking away from tradition. So it was really just, I suppose, when Alma was coming to the end of her tenure as the secretary, or thought she was coming to the end of the her tenure as the secretary, that um, there was a focus on the date and the gathering of information. And I had a great time uh, um, contacting people and asking them would they write things up and so on. And it was lovely because I think there's a piece in there from a parent, a lady that I had never met in my life uh, from uh, Portadown, I think. And she wrote about the experience of bringing her son to the fesh, and it was just lovely. As it turned out, I met her years and years later, and we're actually friends now through a completely different coincidence. But it was just so lovely to get people like Kevin Neary, for example, to write down their thoughts and to capture things. And that would have started me on a trail then of just gathering things for no reason other than that I wanted to. Uh, so by the time we worked our way through all the other celebrations that we've had since then and the museum have done a brilliant job on, on supporting us with that and they have we give I think we give in almost everything that we're not using to the museum to build their archive up so there's a massive archive the Neary family would have given in all their um, programs and paperwork as well so there's a really good resource the research resource in the museum to do with the fish. So yeah, we've had a number of really good exhibitions, loads of material loaned to us and, you know, objects loaned to us and so on and some given in permanently. Mom always attended the, the fish uh, and not just when, when myself or Damien was on stage, but, you know, she was there to support cousins and friends yes, and neighbours. Exactly. But, uh, you know, a couple of the uh, the programmes I have, she's captured the results in them as well. Oh, yes. So uh, she's got her notes down beside it. Um, and, and I, I was looking back and, you know, you look at some of the names and they, they leap out to you as, as who was there in your era and you wonder where are they now? And that's part of what I'm trying to do. If you go at some point, and as I'm sure you probably will, Declan, and look at the very, you know, some of the programmes from all through the years, you're going to see Brenda Fricker in classes alongside Sean Hollywood and, you know, I heard, all Brenda, sorts. I heard Brenda Fricker appeared at the, the New York. She did, oh, she did regularly. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. People yeah, yeah. said there was trepidation when she was appearing because they thought, oh, oh there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They could see that Oscar shining yeah. from underneath and, uh, and that, from that the deeper been... level. It would have been a queer journey from uh, Dublin to Newry in those days just for the fish. It just shows, oh, you, how, but it just shows you how important they thought the fish was. That's and, right. And the they value. used the train, you see, and the, the competitors from Belfast, there was a train, I think a special train put on at a certain time in the evening. I might be wrong about that now. You would need uh, Alma Brown to confirm some of that for you. But uh, yeah, the, the train was a massive thing. Of course, the train was in Edward Street, so it wasn't a matter of going away up the Camden Road to the train. But it was just the adjudicator came on the train and left on the train and the accompanist lived in Belfast and travelled on the train as well. So wonderful stuff, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I'd say the classes then too were probably the big numbers because when you look at some of the classes that, you know, for the, the, the daytime with the schools, you know, you can go up to even in the, in the Golden Jubilee programme, you're up at competitor number 107. If you saw the programme for last year, which never happened, um, 
they, they've had to you say P1, for example, they've had to split that into four, like 1A, 1B, 1C and 1D for the last good number of years. Because the total number of entries would be something like 200 and P1, you know, maybe more, you know, so they split them into, into four. Obviously, this year is going to be so different. And I actually learned that the Newry Festival this year, the Newry Fish this year was going virtual by a friend of mine who is the head of presentation for BBC Scotland. Okay. And she, uh, her daughter plays the flute and she sent me uh, a programme and the uh, the requirements for the Newry Fish via <laughs> her group to Scotland yeah. back to me again. Um, well, I'm just wondering, is the opportunity we were talking about performers from Dublin taking there's part in the fish? There's well, quite a few entries now coming from a much wider catchment area. Well, to be honest, I think at the last we had a short meeting a few days ago, and um, the person in charge of traditional music was informing me that there's a few New York entries and there's a lot of Glasgow entries. And a, a far bigger number of entries than there were last year when it was going to be in person, you know. So um, that's, that's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. Like adjudication, I think it's the people that maybe are not in the festival movement, if you like, or have been in it like yourself, don't realise the actual value, the preciousness really of adjudicated performance and feedback from a professional. You know, yeah. I think that's you know young people doing their music, dance, and speech spend umpteen hours of their life practicing learning things practicing doing exams practicing and actually performing for a professional who can feed back is as rare as it can possibly get so i think we don't realize maybe in the new area just how special that is but our festival as you would know from folklore if nothing else is the biggest in the british isles by some distance and possibly even edges out hong kong as the biggest of its type in the world so you're talking about um numbers as we're familiar with as you just described i mean you mentioned the numbers there we have about fourteen thousand performances in a normal year that's Newry and it's gone virtual. You're chair of the Northern Ireland Festivals Forum. It sounds like a very impressive title, that, and a, a very responsible role. Oh, goodness me. Well, it's, 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 it sounds impressive. Of course it does. But, you know, it's an umbrella body. We meet twice a year with delegates from all the festivals. And it's just a lovely opportunity for people of like mind to get together. And uh, we don't care how many reps come from festivals, as many as can manage it. And in normal times, we would be going to a different place each year, you know, each year. So we would be in Coleraine or we would be in Dungannon or we'd be in Hollywood or Belfast or wherever. Uh, so, um, and Yuri hosts, uh, you know, it takes its turn to host and so on. But we've been virtually meeting and that's been fine. You know, it's been really good because we've met more frequently because of the pressures people have been under trying to make decisions. Uh, a lot of festivals, including ourselves, would have had significant financial losses because of having to give back, you know, f uh, entry fees and pay adjudicators, even though, you know, they weren't working and all of that. So it's been a hard, it's been hard for some of the smaller festivals and it's lovely actually to have that sort of a, a, a Zoom room or a real room full of people whose focus is exactly the same and whose interest is exactly the same. It's, it's just lovely. Between the fish and the festivals, you must have taken part in the music and the dance and the speech for Yuri Fish. <laughs> Well, you see, Declan, my greatest strength is that I don't speak very clearly. I don't sing very well. I used to be able to sing better than I do now and uh, can't read music. And my dancing is very limited. So that, that's a huge strength in, a, in an administrator because it means that you're not on anybody's side or everybody's side at once or whatever. You know, there's a word for that multidirectional partiality. It's a great phrase. <laughs> you're on everybody's side at once. So I don't have my feet in any camp. And that's a huge strength in an administrator. You know, you can get on with the administrating and nobody can blame you for preferring one over the other. <laughs> Are you telling me that you didn't actually stand on the ticket on the stage with one foot in County Down and one foot in County Armagh waiting for the adjudicator to ring the bell? I didn't, but I was on the stage and it was part of a group. I've been on the stage a couple of times as a, as a 
as a school person, child, a school child, as a student at Our Ladies when I was there as a as a pupil, and as a, and a part of a choir, a huge choir, and then as part of a much more intimate group of about I suppose about seven or eight in the fireside singing. Right. Okay. And as it happens, as it happens, we weren't known as a school for winning the fireside singing, and another school in the town wore a green uniform. Um, <laughs> Actually, we're famous for winning the fireside singing. And as it happens, in that particular year, such was the genius of the group that I was in, that we beat that group that had the green uniforms. And it, I don't think they got over it for decades, you know. Oh, so yeah, I know. I would just just like go in, win them, win it and get out again. That was what I did. And that was it. That was it. You <laughs> took that trophy and said, I've reached that. Absolutely, straight back up Canal Street as quick as we could go, you know. But your contribution to the Newry stage and to productions in the Newry stage goes way beyond fish because you were designing sets for new point players and for the Panto. That's uh, right. How did you get involved in that? Well, and that goes back to our ladies again. I was an A level art student at one time and uh, the school was doing a production, a big production, the first big production, I think I'd say the school possibly maybe ever. And it was lilac time and it was being run in the parochial hall. And it fell to me to design the set. So my first set design was a parochial hall stage, um, probably, I don't know, 1970, 69, 70 maybe. Um, not a hundred percent sure. I also just, I mean, honestly, I can't believe it. I had no vocabulary for stage and uh, I knew how to, um, I, I sort of knew for some reason, knew how to go about doing the scenery, you know, but that was just graph paper and rulers and measure the stage and work it out. But um, I didn't realize at the time that the parochial hall was the only place you could fly scenery between Belfast and Dublin. I just thought it was normal. I was so disgusted when I went to the town hall at much later stage in my career to discover that it was not like the there parochial was no, hall. There was no fly tower. No, and there was no scenery dock. And there was none of those things that I took for granted in my early years in yeah. the parochial hall. I suppose I then, um, I think I did my first New Point stuff in the early 80s. And the reason for, I suppose, me being ready to do that was that I'd already joined the staff in Sacred Heart in 1977. Now, as you probably know, the Sacred Heart would do an opera every two years. I was there for 34 years, so that was 17 operas. And uh, a lot of stage craft and things like that went on. Now, I did this, I did the costumes in the Sacred Heart, not the scenery, except for the Irish plays when I did the scenery for the Irish plays and sometimes the costumes as well. So vast amount of learning on the job, I suppose. But New Point was just, I mean, the opportunity to work with Jimmy and Joseph Quinn Declan was, I mean, you would pay big money to be allowed to do that, you know. They, they were brilliant and creative and talented in so oh, many ways. Joseph, I think, well, the two very different roles, as you know, there were two very different men, but uh, Joseph and I worked together very closely hour after hour after hour and just did, you know, whatever I thought I would like to do, I would come in the next evening after work and Joseph would have it worked out and he would have the building done. You know, isn't that what you were thinking about? And I'd say, absolutely you know the man was just a genius basically what was the first show that you designed for new point mary oh under milkwood the great thing about it was that um it of course being a radio play there was not there were no instructions and you could do what you liked now it was nearly all cloth the the, the set was was nearly all cloth overhanging trees and gauze curtain pieces and all sorts of things you know yeah well it was it was the first show that i lit for new point so there you go is that With well you remember the type two of rookies thing. and we got to the opera house <laughs> i know i know i know i know i know so yeah there was loads of i mean i love the i remember the ones that are the most challenging i suppose in terms of you know the ordinary box set stuff i don't even remember some of the ones yeah. i know i did 16 plays and four pantomimes in four years at one stage and the children my children were very small at the time but it was just crazy it was just a, a, a an absolute explosion of, of creativity going on and uh Jean Brody would have fallen into that uh, slot as well, and Tarantara, Tarantara. Uh, dark, and, darkness um, at Noon was a big Oh, Darkness at Noon was 
brilliant, oh. absolutely brilliant. Yeah, okay. I loved that. And Joseph was in his element trying to work out, uh, you know, if the prisoners in the upstairs bedroom stood up, would their heads disappear, you know, or how would we work it so that it looked, oh, yeah, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, loved it. And there was a massive, yeah, I was going to say there was a massive, I wish I knew where it went to, a massive painting of Joe Stalin. Um, right massive. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And it disappeared, of course, at the end of the run. So I don't know where it went. But anyway, that's another story. Oh, the shoot horses, don't they, was also a favourite, just to go back to the favourites. The youth, the youth group we took over the whole of the auditorium, every inch of it uh -huh. uh, was, was done for the set for these shoot horses, don't that's they? Brilliant. And you're yeah. just concerned about not seeing your sets lit. Um, I can tell you they were lit brilliantly. Of course they were. I know that. <laughs> But I mean, I knew how to, I knew what a gobo was, and I made many of them in my time when I was doing uh, Irish plays and so on in the Sacred Heart. So my vocabulary continued to extend. You know, my favourite ever moment of theatre in relation to what I did myself was I think it was I think it was J Charlie Smith would probably say no, it wasn't. I think oh, it was yes, Jack it and was. the Beanstalk. <laughs> It was, I think it was Jack and the Beanstalk. It hardly matters. It was the enchanted forest scene where every one of the 14 foot flats changed from being green and brown to being silver and sparkly in one puff of smoke. Now, the trade secrets is how we did that. It took us a while to work it out, but just literally bang, two seconds and away it went. The complete switch on the stage. Brilliant. Beyond the sort of the the, um, the shows that you've worked in, you know, if you were to sit back and relax and want to see a show just to enjoy it, is there, a, a, would you pick a musical? Would you pick a play? Do you like to go to the movies? I would pick, uh, I would pick, I'd pick a musical, I think. I would pick a musical. I would pick a London musical if such a thing existed at the moment. Uh, yeah, I would. I, I, and I'm, I think the most, well, the most exciting thing I did see had to be the, and wasn't a musical, it was uh, the Golden Compass in the National Theatre in London, which lasted for about five hours. But I just was like a child. Uh -huh. sitting with my eye. my eye, I don't think I blinked for the whole five hours because of the, the revolving stages within stages and coming up and going down and the demons being manipulated by the puppet masters and so on and I thought oh my goodness I you know when I'm at a thing like that I can barely I need to go two or three times you know because yeah. <laughs> the first time I'm only looking at the technical things and then I have to go back again to see uh, to see it as other people might be seeing it. I, I think at the end of uh, at the end of wherever we get to the end of lockdown and uh, beyond that, mm -hmm. it's almost a, a, an excuse for everybody to do Joseph. Because I oh, think yes. the show that you just come out walking on air. That's and, right. Um, That's think, right. Well, it's funny you should mention Joseph because I did 34 years in Sacred Heart and 17 operas where there was where I was doing the costumes and not the scenery. And I didn't know it was my last year there because I hadn't even thought about, you know, taking early retirement. In 2010, they did Joseph. And for some reason or other, I can't recall now, I was asked would I do the set for Joseph. So yeah. I ended up doing one opera in the Sacred Heart with the set. And it was Joseph, and it was my last year there, which is just something that I said I didn't realise at the time. Absolutely love it. Now, I think it would probably be, now that you've reminded me of that, I would say because, because of my associations with it, I would go anywhere to see Joseph, a professional production of Joseph, you know. What yeah, did, love it. What colour did you paint the set? Was it green and oh. yellow and orange and, and <laughs> ruby? And, and, uh, it, you and, name it, you name blue. it. <laughs> absolutely absolutely and all the um the special effects and the goats falling apart and all sorts of things everything had to be done just with an air of simplicity but you know effectiveness at the same time just loved it loved it it was crazy stuff loved it 